to this session, uh, which is part of the New Horizon Project final event, a uh, series of sessions that uh, <clears throat> will last also all this week. Uh, today we are here with my colleagues uh, Darren Meacham and Danny Shanley. We're trying to, we're going to moderate a session that uh, has the title Horizon 2020, from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe, from ethical guidelines to democratic practices. I just want to introduce you to my colleagues. Uh, Darren Meacham is Associate Professor at Maastricht University. He's a, a professor of uh, social and political philosophy. Uh, he has been publishing extensively on, uh, on um, the concept and the identity of Europe, the development of Europe from a phenomenological point of view. He has also published a lot recently on the, on the concept and role of solidarity and the future of work amongst different topics. He's a very, very curious uh, scholar uh, dealing with different, different kind of aspects, but he also dealt in the past a lot with the concept of uh, RI, and he's uh, actually also working on the New Horizon project with me and my colleague Danny Shanley, um, who's a PhD um, at the Ma Maastricht University. She's actually uh, about to finish a PhD thesis called, uh, with the title, Visions of Responsibility in the Technological Society. She tries to look at how industry professionals, scholars, bureaucrats, and activists have shaped ideas about the relationship between technology and society since the 1960s. So kind of a transnational history of responsible innovation, which I'm very looking forward to read because it sounds very promising. So together with Darren and Danny, we will try to um, guide you through this session. Uh, we have uh, four speakers today, uh, which I will introduce you later on while we go. Uh, first, let me just give you a little bit brief introduction of what we're going to talk about today. It's like, I don't know if you had the chance to read the, the abstract that we, that we wrote, that we developed in order to address this uh, this passage between, let's say, Horizon Europe, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe. No, um, in February 2021, Horizon Europe was finally launched by the, the European Commission. It's the next uh, R&D program for the next seven years. Uh, a program that has been described by, by an article on, on Nature as an evolution rather than a reinvention of Horizon 2020. And indeed, there are many points that uh, we, can, we can highlight and detect as an evolution of Horizon 2020. However, there are also some other aspects, uh, broader aspects, which might raise some, some, some doubts or some, some skepticism or some uh, questions. Uh, more specifically, the one, the one point we are uh, interested in to address today is the, the role uh, of ethics in general in this shift between Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, no? On the one hand, we can see that the, the official ethics standards, so the ethics guidelines, have been slightly changed. There's been, a, there's been an introduction, of course, uh, of uh, guidelines and standards for artificial intelligence, because this is going to be the main uh, technology in Horizon Europe, but there have also been some, some changes in terms of uh, uh, we don't have dual use anymore and some other things uh, in the way of assessing projects has been changed and uh, uh, Dr. John Pearson will, will tell us a bit more his opinion about this uh, during the session. Also the concept of RI or the notion of RI uh, seems to be less relevant in Horizon Europe of course at the beginning of Horizon 2020, it was a very promising notion. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about uh, RI, about its value uh, for research, for research and innovation, uh, to, let's say, share the responsibility with researchers, with funding institutions, with the organization, like universities, to try to develop uh, more responsible approaches to research and innovation. And so, kind of trying to, to extend horizontally uh, our responsible approach to research innovation. However, during the years, this, this notion has also encountered several criticism due to the fact that it was considered to be a bit vague, a bit ambiguous, uh, sometimes a bit too abstract, uh, difficult to translate into contextual features, into, into technical features as well. Um, and therefore, perhaps, uh, maybe this is also a criticism to myself as part of the community, we weren't really able to, to mainstream it enough in order for the commission to be able to prolong 
uh, let's say, its role in Rise in Europe. Uh, maybe we were skeptical ourselves in the first place. Uh, we don't know, but uh, the reality seems to suggest that ARI is, uh, as let's say, uh, has been made less prominent with respect to other kind of similar notions like the, the, the famous free O's, no? the openness in the process that now is seen as more relevant than a, than a responsible approach. Maybe the two things can be complementary. But let's say that official documents at the moment seem to suggest that ARI is less, less relevant. So uh, this is to say that perhaps uh, there might be a sensation that the ethics has been, um, uh, I wouldn't say reduced, but uh, uh, less visible, less prominent in Horizon Europe appears to be like this. Uh, this is a little bit, I would say, uh, a little bit against what we experience and what we see, for instance, in other in other fields, in other aspects. For instance, the regulation of AI, you know, which uh, we said is very very salient for the future of research and innovation in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, where we, I think, in 2020, there was there was um, a report saying that we had uh, more than 160 documents. Uh, providing ethical guidelines, uh, which is a consistent <laughs> uh, considerable amount of, uh, of documents um, trying to regulate AI. Uh, the Commission itself now has, uh, has promoted also promulgated also uh, documents trying to um, regulate uh, AI. Uh, at the same time, this role of, a, of ethics, which has been of AI, has also been, uh, let's say, object of, of criticism because. Some of the arguments says fundamentally that this is like uh, trying to uh, avoid to have red lines about the regulation of AI. It's not uh, putting, let's say, into question the democratic control of AI, the objectives of AI. You know? What is the society we're going to create through the AI? But um, stays on this level of uh, abstract and after all subjective regulation of AI. Um, so th th there is this aspect as well that um, that is also emerging. No, the ethics are something that is kind of, uh, if it's not supported by political uh, political institutional conditions and and, uh, and measures, then can be a little bit ineffective or too abstract or even uh, on the very other end, um, passable of, of being manipulated by private companies or big companies like I don't know. Um, Microsoft, uh, Google, and all the others. Uh, so this raises uh, the, the, the second and final point, um, because if the ethics seems to be, uh, let's say, less uh, visible, uh, on the other hand, there are many signals that suggest that the politics instead is becoming a bit more relevant uh, in, Horizon New in Horizon Europe with respect to Horizon 2020. Uh, we all seen the the, 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 the calls that we had last year that was still part of Horizon, Horizon 2020 about the Green Deal, uh, where uh, it was highly advocated to, to foreseen processes of uh, citizen deliberation, citizen participation in order to address the, the, the objectives and the measures to implement the Green Deal. Uh, even other, other signals suggest that uh, the stakeholder engagement that was, let's say, explored, or at least advocated to be explored during Horizon 2020, is now becoming uh, a de facto measure which should be uh, used uh, to address different kind of challenges. So, uh, in this session, we're going to uh, we're going to try to understand uh, from uh, experts, from end users, from practitioners. Um, if this, um, let's say, perception, impression, because of course we are at the beginning of Horizon Europe, so perhaps uh, this is just something that will not be confirmed in future work programs, um, is, um, is also for them quite evident or relevant. Uh, what are the opp opportunities in this? What are the challenges? What are the, the, the risks of, uh, of this shift? And what is eventually uh, the way forward in order to to provide, uh, to, to maintain, to keep what we might, broadly speaking, call a responsible approach to, to research innovation. 
And uh, as I said, today we're going to have four speakers, and um, I would like to start uh, with um, with Nina Brown. Nina Brown is a is a national contact point uh, for class number two society uh, in Germany. She's also the Net for Society project coordinator, and Nina Brown has worked at the German Aerospace Center Project Management Agency since 2009. She coordinates the International Network of National Contact Points for Societal Challenge 6, which is society, more specifically Europe in a changing world, inclusive, innovative and reflective societies in Horizon 20. She's been governing, a governing board member of the European Alliances for Social Science and Humanities since 2018. Um, a group where she was able to uh, discuss uh, about science policy organization. She's been part of uh, uh, lots of discussions at the European Commission level. Uh, I presume also behind the scene negotiations. And uh, I think that Nina's, Nina's contribution can help us understanding a little bit the logic behind this transition. Uh, understand a little bit more what's, uh, let's say, between the lines of this shift, of this transition. So I would like to, yeah, give the floor, uh, if we might say metaphorically speaking, to, to our colleague Nina Brown. Welcome, Nina. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for wanting to listen to me. Um, I'm going to share some slides with you because I have a bit of a theoretical approach as well. Um, and this makes it maybe easier to follow. Um, so to, I, I got a few questions in advance. It has been a, a lot of questions. And um, what I wanted to say is uh, that in the beginning of Horizon 2020, as uh, Robert said, the, the concept of RI had a very prominent status and then um, we had, at that time, we did have a separate program called uh, Science with and for Society, the SWAPS program that you can see here in the Horizon 2020 um, program marked in the red box. And uh, the program itself, the purpose of this program was really to get, um, to move forward the, the areas of citizen science, of gender equality, science education, ethics and uh, research integrity, science communication, open science, and RRI. Um, and also the New Horizon uh, project has been funded under this uh, program. Um, at the same time, sorry, at the same time, RI was a cross-cutting, so-called cross-cutting issue. It has been um, cross-cutting through the entire program of Horizon 2020. So like Robert said uh, in the beginning, it was part in every single um, part of, uh, of, the pro of the different programs more or less successful. I think uh, this has been discussed also at another point because there's, for example, in the excellence science pillar, it was probably more difficult to get RI or the concept of RI implemented because it's a bottom-up approach um, than in the societal challenges. And even in the societal challenges, you have the parts where um, it has been well included, or at least uh, there was uh, there was RI in the in the actual pr uh, project at the end, and there has been parts where it was less successful. Now coming to Horizon Europe, uh, the next framework program, um, we still do have a program in the widening participation and strengthening the European research area prog uh, part of the program, which you see again in the red box down there. And uh, this part of the program has, uh, is equipped uh, with a budget of 438 million euro, so less um, than the actual SWOFs program. Um, was in the in the in in the past uh, in the past, and it um, it 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 does include um, fourteen broad lines, and out of those fourteen broad lines, only five are related to the former SWOFs program. So you have again open science, you have again citizen science, you have gender equality, you have ethics and integrity. 
Now coming to the um, strategic plan of Horizon Europe, um, I don't know, probably you know that the strategic plan has been itself uh, done in a co-creation process. The Commission has launched a consultation as well as the RI days um, in 2019. And uh, the strategic plan does actually define the orientations uh, of the first four years. So there will be a second strategic plan um, coming in 2025 with new uh, orientations. But now you have the four key strategic orientations as well as that's what you see in this picture, the eight horizontal key issues. And there you see again, gender plays a role, ethics plays a role, open science plays a role, um, and they're cross-cutting through the, through, the through the program of Horizon Europe. Um, here you see again, then this is now the specific program, which defines that promoting RRI is still relevant, but here you see it's not throughout the entire program, but, but more to the pillar two, the global challenges, it's where it was most successful um, in Horizon 2020 and where it will be done um, in the in the future it's about strengthening the gender dimension fostering open science promoting the involvement of citizens and end user in co-design and co-creation processes and i think this is something that you can see everywhere in horizon europe here is some legal text um, you see that uh, the words in the legal text are again engage and involve citizens and civil society organizations co-designing co-creation of responsible research and innovation agendas meet citizens and civil society concerns needs and expectations so it's really about society uh, the program shall promote co-creation co-design engagement of citizens and civil society and uh, another one that's in the specific program is promoting responsible research and innovation, improving the relationship and interaction between science communication, promoting the involvement of citizens and end users in co-design and co-creation process. If you would do this in a word cloud, it would look so, like something like this. You have a lot of co-creation, co-creating, citizen engagement, citizen science. And even in your proposal in the excellence part, you have uh, mentioned that soundness of the proposal methodology, including engagement of citizen civil society and end users were appropriate. So this is everywhere now in Horizon Europe. So here is uh, some, just some observations. Um, so Horizon continues to put an emphasis on open science, gender equality, ethics and integrity, as well as science communication. And um, the same then in Horizon 2020, it really tries to get researchers out, like the commission says, of their ivory towers and get them involved with society. Um, Horizon 20, uh, Europe is not about the passive consumption anymore, so it's not like the researchers go and say, okay, where could we do um, some, some um, citizen involvement, but it's more about an active consumption, like in citizen science, in citizen cyber science and science education. You have all those projects with schools where uh, pupils are um, uh, planting tea bags to get obtain um, to obtain data from the soil. You have people uh, passive sensing um, the, the 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 world map um, mapping the world with their mobile devices. You have people getting really involved with uh, research, which means that they also understand how the data, how research is done, how the data is obtained. And at the same time for the researchers is obtaining data. And uh, you have teachers and uh, the pupils understanding um, and getting a science education different from what it might have been before. And you see much more of this uh, lately. Um, so, and another um, observation is citizen and societal engagement improve effectiveness, creativity, and 
quality of research and innovation, they ensure that the outcomes align with the needs, values, expectations of society. This is a quote of an EU representative and I think it uh, sums it up quite well. And uh, last but not least, um, my con conclusions for, on this would be like, I think Horizon Europe is still upholding the ethical principles of Horizon 2020. Like you mentioned, Robert, in the beginning, you still have guidelines. There is the artificial intelligence, which has been added as an issue. Um, but in general, I think uh, it's upholding the ethical principles. What is the shift which has been done is really um, that the groundwork of RI and citizen science has been done in Horizon 2020. That's also why we have less budget now um, for, um, this, um, for this own program. And we, have, we see now that um, the, the knowledge and experience um, that have been uh, prepared during Horizon 2020, they are supposed to be implemented. And for me personally, as an NCP, as having the while having the people on the phone, the critical factors for me are really like the proposal preparation time. It's it it is already very complex to apply for for funding in the EU, but to add such a big thing like oh let's have the citizens participate, but you don't know how. You might have guidelines helping you, but there are so many things out there, and there is always different ways. I think the, the time that you have in the proposal phase, but also in the project is very, very short and it hasn't been adapted from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. And I'm not sure, even though um, open science is now an evaluation criteria in the impact area, I think it's really about um, more about the impact than um, making people really want to do this. I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's my final point. And in case you have any questions, you can ask me now, but in case that the questions come later, you can also contact me afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. No, I think, I think this is very interesting because it kind of confirms a bit uh, certain aspects, but it also raises, yeah, yeah, a counter argument by saying, okay, and this, uh, I think this is, I, I, this is also my impression, the fact that, uh, as you said now, like the work has been done for seven years. We spent so much money on, on RI, on trying to understand how RI should work, how it could be implemented. I mean, this project is also a, a very great example. It's the second most mostly funded project on RI, uh, which has tried to investigate exactly how to translate RI to different to the different. Um, uh, work programs on no? the different lines of the of Horizon 2020, and therefore logically makes sense that uh, the Commission would say, okay, now it's time to move forward and to try to do things. At the same time, I think it's also right what you were trying to highlight is the fact that perhaps uh, this passage was also a bit fast for some practitioners because, of course, uh, social scientists, the human scientists, may might be a bit more, uh, let's say, aware on how to do participatory processes. But when it comes to other fields, perhaps this this knowledge is less uh, less present, and therefore uh, it's also true that we we are assisting of of a let's say um, raising role of the participatory industry they call it. You know these these associations who are who are uh, um, expert in doing only that, um, which yeah on one hand could be could be considered to be good because yeah it's always good to rely on professionals and experts. Uh, on the other hand, we might question if this is done for for democratic purposes or not. Uh, this is um, I'm trying to be provocative today because I would like to really have a like you know uh, a very nice discussion and not always uh, a repetition of the of things that we already know. Um, yeah, so so you do, you do confirm that this this impression that there is there's been let's say uh, at least a, a, a more attention to the political dimension of research and innovation. Um, this is also your impression from from your let's say uh, insider. Uh... Yes, I would say there is 
I, I would I would confirm it, um, but I think it has to do also very much with the impact oriented. So I'm not sure that it's only um, because of uh, we want to be more democratic. I think it's great that the strategic plan has been done the way it has been done. But still, I think there is really a lot of um, yeah, there's really a lot of air to improve the whole thing. And yeah, I think we it needs time. And but yeah. That's yeah, yeah. I see one question from um, Laxmi Prasad. Uh, just wondering if RI has now been moved downstream. I heard impact and expose engagement. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe Laxmi, would you like to articulate a bit? Uh, because I'm not sure I, I can translate this into a question for Nina. Or maybe Nina, you got it. Mm, no, I would also be happy to have some further yeah, explanation. Yeah, you know, we have uh, in academic community, we have argument uh, where we should engage public uh, upstream, downstream, midstream. And then now I hear that RRI is everywhere. And I was wondering if that means uh, we move that downstream and wait until we finish research to engage public. I think RRI has been was supposed to be everywhere in Horizon 2020 already, and now it has been downsized. It was a graphic where you have like the entire program, and now it's only like focusing on um, on part of the program. So on the on the um, on the different. Uh, Destination, so in the topics and not any more on the excellent science. I don't know if this uh, this replies to your question. So I think it has been it's it's less important and it has a less important role in Horizon Europe than it has been in uh, Horizon 2020 um, by 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 legal text. Yeah, one might say that you know another, probably the commissioner would say no. It, now it's even more important because it's everywhere. It's already. <laughs> Okay, yeah. thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Laxmi. Thank you, Laxmi. Ineke also had a, had a, a question about, um, yeah, I don't know if an analysis has been made of the awareness of RI and the capacity to perform citizen science in universities or national research programs, um, you know, like complementing the EU strategy. Probably she's referring to, to also uh, the RI, uh, the RI framework in the different national research funding agencies programs. Ineke? Yes, uh, good morning. morning. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I think if, if the European Commission is the only one pushing RRI, then it's not really likely to be uh, really to take root. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if, if sort of RRI is important both at the European level and at the national level or even in individual universities, then it has more, much more chance that uh, good proposals, in, including RRI or citizen science or open science or all the concepts, will be uh, uh, in, sub, uh, submitted to uh, European calls. So, so that's why I think it's important to not only look at the uh, top-down strategy, but also what is happening bottom-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I can maybe mention one example that we had. We have these uh, network meetings where all the national contact points come together and we were talking about RI and you see that in the different countries there it varies a lot. There is countries they do a lot um, on, on the in this regard, but there are others they are like, why would I would I add work to my proposal? It's already uh, super complicated. Why would I tell this to to people to to add something um, if they pass without it? And that's why it's so important to have it really as an evaluation criteria as well, in case that you don't want to make it mainstream only on national level, but there is has for sure to be some change, but if you wanted to, to have successful proposals in the commission, including RI, you have to you have to value it as well. Mm -hmm. no, I think Ineke is perfectly right, and we we I think we know that some countries are let's say more uh, more attentive or to this kind of things. Like we know that the UK, Norway, the Netherlands, for instance, are very much aware of uh, the importance of RI. Uh, although even there, there are some differences which have yeah, caused some, some kind of uh, disagreement, theoretical disagreement, I would say. 
uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's fundamental also at the, the national level, like these things are considered to be important. Otherwise, researchers are confused, you know, because they apply for the European funding and then they have to apply this. They, they apply for the for the national funding, they don't have to do that. And I think research cannot be fragmented in such a way because it really creates some kind of confusion in the long run. And I think we are kind of experiencing a little bit this, I would say also on the, on the, on the AI strategy. Uh, if you go and have a look at the different national strategy documents, it's sometimes puzzling because you see that there's no too much of a European holistic approach to, to AI, a more a national one. Which some, some might raise some 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 you know doubts about uh, what's uh, what's the future strategy. But I think we can address this with our first speaker later on, with Georgios, who's an expert on these kind of things. Thank you very much, Nina. That was very very nice of you, uh, providing us with some data, not only you know opinions. Uh, it's very very good. Thanks a lot. I think that uh, we can now pass to our second speaker. Uh, John Pearson, John Pe Dr. John Pearson is a policy officer for ethics and research integrity at the Vrai Universitet in Brussels, the Free University. He has, of course, been uh, involved in several projects, uh, also with me. He's a dear friend and colleague. He's a philosopher and political scientist. Uh, he's now actually exactly dealing with the, with the hardcore ethics uh, for his university in connection with the European Commission. Um, so I would like him to to maybe also give us, uh, you know, his opinion, his insider opinion from another perspective on the role of ethics, what he sees as an opportunity uh, with a new uh, way of addressing ethics guidelines and standards in Horizon Europe and what might be the risks uh, behind there. And um, therefore, I would like John to help us in understanding a bit more what's really going on there. Are you there? Yep. Yeah, I'll just unmute myself and start my video. Welcome. So, can everyone hear me okay? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm in my kitchen at home, so there's probably a slight echo. It probably sounds a bit strange to you all, but... Um, so, yeah, you said uh, Nina, Nina's presentation was very uh, focused on figures and, and stuff. I'm going to give more of an opinion, I suppose, because um, I, I work at the VUB, uh, which is a relatively small university, so I see, as Robert said, I see things quite directly in, in my role, and I'm actually involved in ethics assessment for individual projects. I don't have such a big big picture overview of what's going on um, since I've, I've been working on my current job. But I thought what might be interesting to talk about today um, out of my experience is specifically uh, the role of dual use and military uh, misuse stuff in ethics evaluations um, because that's something I'm, I'm involved in. I, I'm Among my various roles that I have, I'm, I'm secretary of uh, ethics Committee for Dual Use, Military Use and Misuse at the VUB, uh, which is a really interesting function, but it's also quite a hard, hard work as a, as a job. Um, and I'm really, really interested to see the, the evolution from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe and how the approach to dual use and, and military research has changed. Um, I thought it was quite odd or, or quite um, interesting at my previous job at, was at the KU Leuven and there I, I saw stuff from the LIRA, the League of European Research Universities, which is a, uh, a league of fairly elite institutions across the EU and their policy position on stuff like dual use was that they really were keen to keep the exclusive civil focus uh, in, the, in the Horizon programs or the European research programs. Um, yet that, that exclusive civil focus has certainly been weakens, uh, perhaps watered down, um, the, there's a defense industrial program and, and the research funding that comes from that. Uh, so the exclusive civil focus has certainly not disappeared entirely, but it's certainly become less prominent in, uh, in the uh, current framework program and the upcoming framework program, which is an interesting evolution, of course. Um, and at the same time, we have this idea that dual use has, has been pushed into a into the impact section of the projects and projects are now evaluated more in a technical way in terms of dual use rather than uh, in terms of dual use ethics. These are quite significant changes, very significant changes in, in the upcoming program. And for me, it was, it was almost a shock to see the way it, it happened. I organized a session on dual, dual use ethics um, in this November, December last year. And it was 
quite soon before that session that this whole idea that um, uh, the exclusive civil focus and uh, the ethics role of dual use would, would be changed quite significantly. Um, and it was it was a major change, but it was a change that seemed to happen quite rapidly. Of course, I'm not so in touch with, with how, how these things work anymore since I'm not being involved in, in European projects so much. But even so, as a, a policy officer, it, it was quite a shock. Um, and it's also quite a, a difficult thing to deal with because um, national level ethics evaluations tend to follow the European Commission's approach. So, for example, in, in Belgium, the ethics evaluation of our, our national funding council resembles quite closely what you get at, at Horizon, Europe, uh, Horizon 2020 level. So you have the same kind of categories of ethics checks. Um, there is a dual use ethics check in there. Um, and, and as Robert says, if you have these kind of changes like this, you can get quite a disconnect between what the researchers are seeing at, at um, European level and what they see at, at national level. Um, so this, this makes things kind of confusing for the researchers. Like we were starting to get traction for the idea that they have to consider dual use and it's, it's quite hard work to convince them that it's actually an important ethics issue um, when they're doing their national level funding. And now suddenly dual use is not so important in the European level. So the researchers are, are maybe going to be more resistant and saying, well, you know, why is it so important at the national level when the European Commission doesn't seem so concerned? So this was quite a big change, and it was quite a sudden change, and, and for me, it was interesting to see how how, how it happens. Um, it seems like one of the ideas is that, that dual use is considered a technical issue, partly because the people who are qualified to evaluate dual use um, often need very high level technical knowledge of what exactly um, particular types of technology can and can't do, um, what are the parameters for these kind of things. Um, dual use is regulated by this, this famous uh, dual use um, law from 2009, um, which gives specific technical definitions of, of what kinds of products are or aren't considered um, dual use or not. And you do need a certain level of technical knowledge to understand what that's all about, like, you know, what particular kinds of lasers can do, what different types of pathogens can do and so on. It's very technical stuff and we do need people with that technical expertise in our committee. Um, but the problem with dual use is it's something that sits on the borderline between this very technical stuff and, and stuff that people see more as, a, as an ethics issue or something that needs more reflection and, and more discussion and debate. So kind of cutting the two in half and saying, okay, misuse stays as an ethics evaluation parameter, whereas dual use stays as a, as a um, as a more technical parameter, it's it's understandable in a way, but I find it hard to justify because dual use does actually need ethics reflection as well. This is a main role of our ethics committee. I, I carry out a, a technical check, a very basic technical check by searching for things when our ethical committee evaluates a project. But then the discussion that goes on in our dual use committee is, is more ethic, ethical and sometimes political about the more kind of open-ended issues like should we work with Israel, should we work with China and so on. Um, and I think the two need to really be kept closer together so that people can um, understand the technical issues alongside the, the ethics issues rather than having them as, as two things that are separate. Um, in terms of how this all happened as well, I, I've, I find it quite difficult to understand. I mean, in my opinion, what would have been really interesting would have been to have a, a European level project within SWAFs or within whatever the current version of SWAFs is going to be where there was actually more open debate about how this stuff would, would carry on in the new pr framework program. So you could have had a very specific project focused on the ethics of dual use technologies, the ethics of military technology and so on, so that there would be more discussion about, about what we actually need to evaluate these things. Um, there's a lot of resources that are needed to deal with this kind of stuff. There's a lot of resources at all kinds of different levels. Um, there's resources in terms of intellectual resources, um, technical resources, how do we debate about dual use technologies? Um, one thing I'm constantly conf confronted with, which is incredibly frustrating for researchers, is that they just say, oh, well, anything can be misused. So, you know, it's all a bit irrelevant. You know, you can just use your fantasy and come up with a misuse for any kind of project. It's incredibly frustrating to get past that mental barrier on the part of researchers. And a project that would help us to do that would have been really, really welcome and really, really useful to give people scenarios and case studies and ideas about how how a project can go from being a kind of innocent project to one that's more difficult to deal with in an ethical way. And I mean, maybe I'm not following this stuff closely enough, but I've never seen anything like that that actually came out from the SWAS program. Maybe there's still a, an opportunity to do that in the future, but I think that's something that would be would have been really useful. Um, 
so this is a kind of two, and then the other kind of barrier that we come across is like you know even even my my more um, bureaucratic colleagues. The first thing they think of when you talk about dual use is, are you going to block projects? You're going to block projects. Things are going to be stopped. We're not going to be able to go on. So we're still stuck with that mental barrier where everyone's terrified of this stuff because they think it means arms embargoes and not being able to do stuff. And we're working very hard to try to explain to people actually it's about facilitating good projects. Um, there's a very interesting presentation from King's College London a few weeks ago where one of the case studies they had was developing a nuclear research program with India. Um, and that's something that wouldn't have been possible without a very well worked out dual use approach to the project. Um, they were able to, to get very high level Indian scientists to come and work with the EU and vice versa because the dual use aspect was well addressed and we need resources to help people do that and to also help people understand that dual use is about facilitating worthwhile research as well. So again, a, a good project would have helped with that. Um, and then finally, one of the things that I think we need is, is more of a central um, database or, or a central kind of um, portal where we can get in contact with other people who are addressing similar issues that we do. Um, my university is quite small, so we don't have a lot of cases or, or precedents for, for issues that we've addressed. I mean, we see maybe three or four projects a year coming through our committee that are really about very specific dual use issues. So to have a database of, of um, previous decisions that have been made by other committees so that we can look at those and use them for training so on would also be a very useful resource to have. Um, so I think this, this could have actually been done in the context of a European project where we have open discussion about what exactly do we want from a framework programme. Do we want to be funding military research or not? Uh, do we want to be encouraging dual use research that maybe is more likely to go in the military direction? Uh, this is a kind of ethical debate and it's a kind of citizen science democratic debate that needs to be carried out and I don't think it really was and at the same time the project can also develop the kind of resources we need to address these often very difficult questions and to get past the, the mental barriers that we're, we're confronted with when we're, when we're dealing with researchers. Um, so in this case I think there's been a lot of talk about this citizen engagement, citizen science, democratization of the research process but my experience of, of the transition from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe in, in this specific issue of, of um, dual use military use and misuse of research has not really reflected that, um, that approach, unfortunately. Um, I'd be interested to see how it develops in the next program. Um, and I'd be interested to hear people's opinions on, on their own experiences. Um, so that was a bit of a kind of impressionistic viewpoint of, of my, my experience with this particular issue. So, so thanks for your attention. Yeah, no, I think that's a very, two, at least from my perspective, two very important sides. Like, you know, because of course we're talking about dual use, but I think dual use, uh, maybe for some of us could, might not be seen as immediately uh, relevant, but I think it, it is immediately relevant because it's like, especially if we, if we consider, as I said at the beginning, that uh, artificial intelligence is going to be the main technology de developed in, uh, in Horizon Europe and in the, the, le the, the next decades. And I think uh, when it comes to that, the interconnection between dual use and AI is very, very, very strong. Um, and it raises a, a, a big point and in the sense, at least from my perspective, the fact that uh, what you uh, suggested is the fact that uh, first we need to try to, to modify the understanding, this label that the ethics guidelines do have of being something, you know, blocking projects or representing red lines or trying to, you know, uh, yeah, be a bit like negative or reducing the, 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 possibility, the freedom of research, which is not the case because exactly as you said, the ethics reviews at the commission level, they're done for the opposite purpose. Is they're done to, to make research uh, even better, even from a scientific point of view, because considering certain ethical aspects help projects to, to think a bit more carefully on how to do things. Uh, the other more, and I think uh, really highly related to the discussion today, is this fact that, you know, when we have uh, changes uh, in ethical regulation or in ethical uh, recommendation, uh, perhaps, as you say, these changes should be should undergo some scrutiny, some public scrutiny, some, some public discussion, some public uh, reflection, or something a little bit more extended, which doesn't seem to be so the case uh, with, the, with these changes in, in, in the dual use understanding. No? Uh, it seems like 
uh, this decision was not shared with the, with practitioners, with end users. I mean, you you deal with these kind of things all the time, and I, from what I understood, you were not very involved into a discussion about how to go forward um, with dual use in Horizon Europe. Uh, I think this this really touches the, the the core of our discussion today. It's like you know how uh, the ethics should also be framed or supported by a, a more democratic and political. Uh, framework, let's say, no. Um, which, yeah, I think this this example really clarifies uh, the potential risks of leaving, let's say, the ethical dimension uh, alone or abandoned or, or in the hand of uh, of some, instead of enlarging it a bit, no. Well, would you say that this is capturing a bit for you? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... There's obviously a challenge with, with dual use and military use in the sense that it's not necessarily something that you can do in a, in a very open way because um, you know your your you're starting to talk about very sensitive strategic strategic issues, um, very sensitive issues around collaboration with China and so on. Um, but for example, in Belgium there is a um, a working group around knowledge security, um, which is a sort of it's a closed group, so you have to be invited to join it, but it is a, a space for dialogue on these very difficult issues. Um, so I think that was a, a kind of compromised position. It's, I can understand that the military research and strategic issues are not something that you can necessarily do in a, in a completely open democratic way because they're so sensitive, but at the same time, there are in between ways to do some kind of engagement, some kind of discussion about what exactly people want to do. But even there, the, the mentality is, is quite bureaucratic. So for example, for example, in Flanders, we have an organization called the Flemish Peace Institute. Um, and I think they would have been a really good organization to have included in that closed discussion group, but the mentality is still quite closed and there's not a, a movement to include civil society in these kind of discussions, um, which I think is something that was encouraged in RRI, but has not really crossed over into all of these different, um, these kind of forums or, or spaces for, for debate. Um, so I think there is a need for, like, like you say, reflection and public discussion about exactly what, what we want to do. Um, but I think when you get down to actually specific applications of technology, then, then the public engagement becomes more tricky. But I think definitely there's room for, you know, there's, there's no, not been any discussion about does the public want Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020 to be used for military research or not? Uh, what, what are their preferences about this kind of stuff? Um, no, exactly. But I think that's the point because it's like, okay, even with, with other kind of technologies, you now when we talk about transparency and public engagement, I think that uh, we shouldn't be too naive in thinking that, uh, let's say, the average citizen is able and willing, and this is the old democratic argument, uh, willing or able to understand everything and to have a word on everything. But I think that it's still important that the, the citizens could have uh, at least possibility to, to to discuss about the trajectories the objectives of things you know uh, mm -hmm. especially with dual use i mean we don't have to go into technical details for everything but we we probably might want to uh, enlarge discussion on what is this technology for what kind of society we would like to create in the future you know uh, mm -hmm. which is a bit of a more of a meta level question but still this i think this is the the, the, the true aim of democratic uh, uh, processes is to try and understand where we're going and not exactly how to get there because of course experts can can help us in, in doing that uh, we have to also stay efficient in our societies we cannot um, block everything no? uh, <laughs> there's a there's a question from from Darren Darren would you like to pose your, the question yourself yeah sure I mean it's a very very general question and I think your comments just now kind of actually summed up the, where that question came from. So my question was just about, I mean, the increased prevalence of projects involving data-driven technologies and AI technologies and how that, if that's, let's say, expanded the scope of how we understand uh, concerns about and risks about, about dual use. Um, and to what extent, I mean, I guess that goes a little bit beyond just the concerns about military, military usage. Um, so it's a very broad question, so I, I'll just leave it at that. Hand it over. Yeah, I mean, it's in a, in a way, it's it goes back to some of the classic things that RRI was trying to address, where AI is not taken up in the export control regulations at all. So there's no legal barrier for people to go and work with China in AI because there's no if you compare it to chemical weapons or, or nuclear weapons or something like that. 
Um, I mean, it, I can imagine it would be an absolute nightmare trying to define parameters for what should and shouldn't be exported in the context of RRI, in, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, sorry. Um, but that kind of emphasizes the need for more reflection and, and, and more open discussion about what exactly we should and shouldn't be doing in, in this kind of context uh, or how to facilitate it in a responsible way. Um, so I think this, this situation around a, uh, artificial intelligence reinforces the need for something that, that continues at RRI and reflex to, to have more detailed reflection about technology in society. I mean, again, for me, you know, I'm, I'm a complete um, artificial intelligence uh, lay person I you know I, I struggle with the basic concepts so it's it's difficult for me to to say something in detail about the specificities of it um, um, but you see how, how a lot of technology is on the borderline like um, technologies that can be used for um, seemingly quite innocent purposes like security um, at airports can also be used for facial recognition in a, a lot more sinister way and, and you know, the, the borderline is, is very fine between these different applications. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, uh, yeah, no, thank you for that. I think that we can continue the discussion for, uh, with our next uh, speaker, uh, Georgios, who's also, who's also uh, an expert on these kind of things. And I think he, he can, like, give us, let's say, uh, the, the complexity uh, which, you know, a political framework has to deal with in order to develop, uh, let's say, future technologies or research innovation in general. Uh, of course, we're talking again about AI because, as I said, AI is going to be the main uh, object of, <laughs> of regulatory efforts in the next decade. And ha the complexity of trying to, let's say, position yourself as a, as a, as a, as a country, as a, something that we can say uh strategic non-dependence no sovereignty uh, of countries of europe in general how this has to kind of deal with uh, with economic drivers with uh, with ethical drivers and most of all as i said with the objectives of uh, of uh, implementing these kind of technologies no what are, what are, what are the what are the objectives that these strategies are trying to to bring forward and now uh, citizens uh, how democratic control is also uh, implemented or at least uh, given attention to. So our next speaker, Georgios uh, Koleriakis, is an advisor for research strategy at uh, DGAP in Germany. He serves as a principal investigator on the EU's uh, media uh, project and the pilot preparatory action on defense research Solomon. Uh, Georgios has more than 15 years experience in public policy analysis and has worked with national ministries and international bodies, the Commission, the Council of Europe and the OECD on issues of anticipatory security governance and the transfer of evidence to policy. So I would like Georgios maybe to, to help us understanding how the, the, the interconnection between the, the, the ethics, let's say the regulatory aspects of technologies and the political aspects on different levels, not only of democratic control, but also of uh, political objectives are, uh, you know, uh, what what is this? What is happening in this phase of transition between Horizon Europe, Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, uh, and also considering what Ineke was saying, you know, the, the connection between the national level and the European level. Um, I, I'm very curious to understand also, like how this relation between nations, national states, and the and European bodies are are trying to align uh, on political methodologies and political objectives, which is, I think, the, 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 final, the final key question that uh, the final speaker will also address, you know, the, the difference between these, these two levels, the objectives and the, uh, the methodology to get there. Um, Georgios, are you with us? Can you hear me now? <laughs> Good morning, hello. Thank you very, very much. Uh, for having them, I'm very glad, particularly because, not only because we have been sitting together in a similar orchestration last year at the workshop in uh, Seville, but also since I remember that years ago we have been present at the kickoff meeting of the New Horizons project in Brussels. And um, um, I think all those uh, topics are extremely um, talent 
um, uh, from a political perspective as well. Um, and I wish to, um, um, to make that sort of, not, not merely political set, uh, the, the political setting or the embeddedness of a research program, but rather the ambition of mine has been to, to say something about the geo-economical, the geostrategic position of a, of a huge research program like that one by the Commission since years. I mean, not from FP1, so to speak, until now for Horizon Europe. Of course, to help you understand better, I think this is a little exaggerated. I'm not sure whether I, I will be able to, to, um, to, to do so, but um, um, I will definitely um, touch upon the very diplomatically uh, formulated frustration by Nina. Uh, and I will also, I, I will not resist the temptation to say something about dual use. I was not planning to do so, but since John very clearly uh, presented that uh, case study, and since we will be embarking with the German Council on Foreign Relations on a big dual use governance project for the next uh, three years, funded by the German Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. I will say something on that as well. So um, I will be speaking in my, strictly in my personal capacity uh, on we those can, issues. We cannot and stop uh, one though, eh? we cannot stop from FP1, otherwise... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I do not know. <laughs> um, I wasn't born back then. So uh, now, the interesting thing is that Europe has been set, the, e, the European Union, the EU has been setting standards in very many areas, also in research and innovation. This is something, this is a fact. Um, it may not have been uh, working 100%, but worldwide um, uh, the EU has been setting standards. And those standards are not necessarily on the hard regulation side, on the side of red lines and uh, legislation, but it has been on the also softer side, on the side of softer regulation in terms of guidelines and good practices and so on. Um, the first point I would like to make is that research and innovation, research development and innovation is only one of many instruments we need to, uh, to take it together with other policies, um, with industrial policy. Right now, I mean, the past uh, one and a half years, we have seen uh, with the new commission uh, the publication of many action plans and papers um, on the um, uh, digitalization uh, uh, aspect of, um, of Europe, uh, data management policies, artificial intelligence policies. All those may seem, and many times they are not conceived as a whole of government approach to use it in quotation, I mean, a little metaphorically, but all of them and together with export and trade policies and also with security and uh, defense policies, they build as they, they build a whole and somehow in order for all those policies to deliver, they need to dance together. So I, I, I wish to, I, I perceive at least, uh, Horizon 2020, but also Horizon Europe as one, one sort of policies that interact with other policies in order to deliver something. Now, this something, what is this? Which is the overarching goal? Which is the strategic goal? If we take it to be that sort of sovereignty or uh, strategic independence or strategic non-dependence, or resilience, or capacity to act. Um, I think this is still an ongoing debate in, in Europe. 
as, as an example, as a contrast to that, I bring the debate in the US, which have already in an impressive manner, pretty different uh, to the uh, European or the, to the EU European one, they subordinated the artificial intelligence strategy very clearly to national security concerns. So um, the National uh, Security Council has published the beginning, at the beginning of uh, March, a 750 uh, policy paper that goes in a very, very unusual manner, uh, in a very detailed way, it operationalizes what should be done in order for artificial intelligence to serve US American uh, goals, but also um, in favor of uh, the goals of liberal democratic states uh, across the world. So this is, um, you, you can download it, it is publicly available, this version, the 750 page version, and there you will see um, all aspects, all policy aspects that need to be thought uh, about in order to make uh, that sort of research and innovation strategy deliver. So my first question would be, uh, first of all to myself, that do Europeans think um, in a similar way, they do not need to subordinate everything to national security. The Europeans may say, we want to achieve resilience or strategic non-dependence. This is something very different with the supremacy and primacy goals that the US has been traditionally, traditionally having. Um, but do we think all those research and innovation programs always in combination with everything, with all the other policies? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, this has been my first point. The second point is um, the, the current rising context of a fierce uh, competition between the US and the People's Republic of China with regard to technology, but also to trade internationally. And in my assessment, this will be the game the European, European Union needs to position itself in the years to come. Also with uh, regard to investments, to huge investments in research and innovation. And in this regard, the very, the usually very dry and boring aspects of trade and with, of imports and exports, um, which ranges from uh, equipment and devices and components like microprocessors and semiconductors up to raw materials, including also critical raw materials, but also much more, and I wish to, to stress that, exchange of intangible goods, that is of knowledge produced within research projects. Um, I think that many more thoughts need to be done in, the, in, in, this, in this context. And to, bring, to, to make it a little more concrete is that the, um, the interplay between openness and closure in, res, in research, huh? um, open research and innovation and open access and so on. This is a little more complicated because a lot of insights produced I, I do not say products, I do not say technological devices, I say insights. It can be a piece of intangible knowledge. That sort of insights can be used both for military and for civilian purposes. And I will somehow use a definition of dual use that does not differentiate between good and bad, evil and beneficial, I will say that we have, let's say, military and, uh, and civilian purposes in the technology. 
some of the military purposes are also legitimate and also intended. But we are mostly interested in non-intended and probably non-anticipated malicious usages of technologies and of know-how that starts, that is included in those technologies. And that's why we need to have that sort of anticipatory mechanisms or early, early on in that value chain, huh? already the fundamental research, in order to enable such technology development to deliver on the set legitimate goals that will have a beneficial effect in order to, uh, let's say, prevent them from misfiring. Misfiring means always opportunity costs. Why have you invested millions and billions of euros into that and not to, to something different that would have been better? And mostly in order to prevent or at least minimize the backfiring risk. That we have poured money into areas that have uh, somehow produced, they have delivered, they have resulted into counterproductive effects. That is into, let's say, malicious usage of those um, research results. And we may have, I mean, very many examples of dual use uh, research. I mean, they range from the microwave oven, I mean, to bring a very well known example that resulted from the uh, sonar technology in the Second World War that became uh, uh, over the decades in the 50s and the 60s, it, it was becoming smaller and uh, smaller, the microwave oven and moved into the kitchen and it became very affordable. But another example, um, which occurred to me because of a friend's uh, surgical operation the past weeks, you know, what surgeons, the instrument surgeons use in order to dilute and break uh, the line scale deposits, this calcification in inner organs, there are ultrasonic devices. And the major producer internationally of those surgical instruments is Lockheed Martin, a fighter jet company. So you see, in the, in the development, in the research development innovation process, technology development is one thing, but the application is something else. It comes a little later, it is not always foreseen, Sometimes I would dare say it is not even foreseeable. I think the majority of the people um, attending uh, this conference might have heard, probably have heard about the Collingridge dilemma. Uh, we know this term since the 80s, that at the early stages of research, this assessment of what this, um, yes. uh, the results of the technology will be used for is extremely difficult. Oh, and perfect. if we are, at a later stage of, of research, at a higher TRL, at a higher technology readiness level, it is very hard to steer, to prevent, within brackets, uh, certain undesirable usage of technology. So this is why we definitely need RRI in order to connect it with, with the overarching topic of this discussion. We definitely need such an ex-ante assessment mechanism. I am not personally in love of RRI um, or of ethics in particular, but definitely we would need, we need a functioning ex-ante risk assessment mechanism that contains also an ethics assessment that will contain also uh, many or some at least of the aspects that the very rich uh, RRI uh, template has been presenting the, the years ago. But this needs to be implementable. This needs to be um, feasible and this needs to be taken up by the people that 
uh, perform those research, development and innovation actions. And this do not sit merely at universities. They sit also in small and middle-sized enterprise. They sit in the industry and also not least in policy making organizations. And from my experience, at least, I have to say that the awareness levels of that sort of ex ante risk uh, and responsibility assessment mechanisms with all those stakeholder species is still rather low. Um, I think university people are not aware about let's say potential dual use risks in their research. And we are not talking about um, hardcore uh, technology researchers that uh, build, uh, I do not know, drones uh, equipment or, some, or some, something like that. It could be really social scientists that produce a piece of assessment that can be abused. I think history has shown to us that even uh, a piece of, um, cultural and anthropological advice like that so the anthropologist Margaret uh, Mead during the Second World War had provided to the US Department of Defense with regard to cultural and behavioral habits of the Japanese has been is an example of how uh, SSH research can be used also for military purposes. So Probably that sort of the, the backfire risk is all around us. When we talk about risk, we do not mean always uh, the negative, the danger part. Risk contains at the same time the chances uh, for profit and the chances for loss. So I think this needs to be uh, streamlined in a very, very practical implementable uh, way with regard uh, to very many aspects of the current Horizon Europe program. I do not only, uh, I will not exclude uh, any SSH related research. I would include also SSH um, research, but of course, what is really very obvious is to tackle, uh, let's say domains like this artificial intelligence cluster, all those machine uh, learning supported um, uh, technological applications in very in other domains, which are that sort of this that sort of research is genuinely uh, multi-purpose, and this needs to be reflected um, in a more systematic manner. I think we are not there yet. It's becoming um, more and more demanding than in the past. And um, I'm not sure whether uh, the current architecture within um, uh, Horizon Europe uh, allows, uh, allows for that. Um, I don't think that uh, that's, uh, Horizon 2020 did that. Perhaps the majority of the people involved in designing uh, Horizon 2020 perceive that as, um, as a test bed to develop it and so on. But I think that the, it's a pressing need to, um, to pass into practice now with that, with that sort of um, ex ante assessment and uh, responsibility awareness about uh, what we are doing in research and innovation. Thank you very much. Um, I think, I think you're, you're really touching at the core issue of the, the old discussion that we're having today. It's like, you know, how, how we need to do an ex ante uh, assessment, evaluation, uh, you might call it in different ways. Uh, how do we do that? That's the thing, you know, and um, I think that we are a bit short in time, uh, so I don't want to cut you too uh, short. I'm very sorry for that, but I think you are kind of posing a question to which I think Bernard Reber, our next speaker, is really willing to respond to. Like, what are the practical measures in order to do that? Uh, what kind of 
ex ante process of evaluation we can have that could be both legitimate and efficient in a way because we have to as you said we have to also keep in mind that these processes should be efficient in a way no should keep an eye or let's say um, an attention on, on the uh, the, the practical constraints uh, of uh, of gathering uh, different actors together and uh, uh, providing an opinion about something. So I, there's also a question, but if you don't mind, I will take them at the end so that uh, we we guarantee the fact that we can close at more or less at the foreseen time. And then if people are interested, can stay and we can have a discussion, which I'm very happy to have with all of you. Uh, thank you again, Georgios, because you are, you gave a really like comprehensive, exhaustive picture of uh, the different political issues, both in terms of objective and in terms of the methodology. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Professor Bernard Rebert. Uh, it would be very difficult to list all the expertise and the roles that Bernard has. I can only say that he is a, he is a CNRS uh, um, habilitated senior, senior research fellow. He works at, at the Cevipo for Sciences Po Paris. Um, he, of course, has a HDR um, to supervise research in philosophy. He's a general coordinator of the human and social sciences section of the Encyclopedia Sciences, which comprises 850 volumes. He's been working on, uh, on the relation between participatory processes and deliberative democracy for several years. Uh, he has worked extensively on the Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat, for the, for the climate um, change that happened in, in France, uh, working at the very high level with, the, with the, the presidency, if we might say. And he's uh, also about to come out with a new book about deliberative democracy, which we are very looking forward to. Uh, Bernard, if you would like to, to address these issues that we've been uh, trying to raise up to now, and give us the final truth about how to go forward. Thank you very much, Bernard. It will not perhaps uh, be the final one. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to return back to you, to uh, the New Horizon Project partners. Uh, I remember in, in Vienna, it was the place where, where I have understood that uh, responsible innovation was a kind of um, it was a kind of covering word uh, on uh, already existing practices. But we have not taken that as such. And we, we, we can say perhaps that responsibility, and I will defend this, uh, is a, a kind of a horizon of aspiration or a, a future horizon or expectation horizon. In French, we have coming from the phenomenology horizon d'attente. Uh, I've tried to uh, share my PowerPoint presentation. You have it on the screen? Yes, but can you switch to full screen? Uh, yeah, I will do this. Great. Better, sir? Perfect. Yes, thank you, Bernard. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so it's a bit the journey, but uh, keep cool. Uh, we will not have time to cross everything. But uh, to, to, to sum it, uh, okay, now we speak about participation, open, op everything is open. But uh, yes, uh, participate, but, but why? Uh, it's not an easy question. And very, very often we have a lot of different assumptions. And how? And we have uh, the chance in France to have this uh, unexpected debate, the Grand Débat National, I will return very fast on this and uh, the famous citizen convention for the climate. And we will have now, uh, it's already um, dans les starter, in the starter, uh, the uh, conference for the future of Europe. We have participation everywhere. Yes, but how to assess participation and especially with heterogeneous public, we think, and it was already said, uh, Nina has, um, uh, given the, the, the quote that, okay, we think that the Europeans are united, but if you connect politics and ethics, you have the big problem of the difficulty of judgment and of moral pluralism. And uh, I will say a couple of, of words on ethics, okay? The scope can be very different if you start from ethical reviews, the deontology of the researcher, the expecting 
ethical guidelines regarding artificial intelligence, for example, or um, justice, social justice, big word, big question, big aspiration, there you will have the difficulty of judgment and you have very clever philosophers, Rawls and Habermas, who has already said to us that it's impossible to tackle these questions. And uh, what kind of democracy, and, and there I will uh, only uh, give a brief, very brief uh, presentation of, of an inquiry, opinion poll we have done a couple of years in, in, uh, ago in, in, in France, and uh, um, deliberation, deliberative democracy is much more higher and ex expected by the inquiries than open democracy or participative democracy. And uh, uh, seven, the 7.7s, 7 7, it's a question of, uh, we have to move from critical citizenship to critical citizenship. We think very often that citizens are very, very in favor of democracy and discussion and all these kind of things. But uh, in France, but, but it was the worst in the US, uh, we speak in, in political science about critical citizenship it means that around 30% of the people, they don't care of, on politics because politics is, is a, a lot of time and, and it's, it's not uh, efficient enough. So we want to let participant, uh, 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 democracy be more open, more participative, but we have to take into account that people are very critical, but in the first level of criti criticism, the, it's a negative sanction towards the things, and it's not the critical, uh, a big uh, a critical meaning of um, modernity or in the heart of democracy. Only uh, a reminder, uh, democracy is the only system uh, uh, that uh, accepts the criticism. And at the end, uh, perhaps uh, an openness to uh, rest responsible systems of responsibilities, because I think this is the future. We have to move from this kind of labs with 150 people uh, take to, uh, talking together with uh, good kind of uh, uh, informations, with uh, uh, pluralist concerns, but okay, it is only one lab, and we have to, to, to go out of this kind of uh, ivory tower uh, in, a, in, a, in a, it's not the uh, the official meaning of, of uh, ivory tower but but uh, it's it's true here too uh, okay this is a, an old way to organize participation it was perhaps 10 years ago this kind of citizen conference you know very well the rules and you know how what to do in the uh, the different uh, uh, steps of, of, of this uh, citizen conference in three weekends. Now we have the yellow vest uh, experiment. It was the, the year 2019. They are very well organized and they, they want to have a direct referendum for everybody in France. And after that, you have a kind of counter fire. Uh, uh, the government has proposed the Grand Débat National and you see it's a very complicated thing. It uh, has cost, the, the cost of this, the budget was uh, 17 million euros. So it's, it's uh, uh, around eight ERC, uh, a European research project. Uh, and you have the Garon, you have ministers involved, you have a platform with uh, around two million uh, heats and proposals. Uh, you have uh, uh, more than um, uh, uh, 10,000 uh, local debates on this kind of things, and you have 19 uh, regional debates. So it's a very, very thing. And I don't know what we are doing when we try to organize research with, uh, with citizens. And okay, it's only to give uh, some uh, pictures, but, but okay, we have done that. And after that, what can we say? Uh, what was it for? For the Grand Débat National, we had four questions, but we have no goals. And there, it's only a reminder to say, okay, when you want to organize participation or deliberation, the minimal is the minimum is to have some goals. And after that, we have 
uh, 30 years of experiment and uh, we have a lot of uh, design, more than 50 different designs with different possibilities. We have reflections about the social ontologies, how people or individuals are or are not connected with their groups. Uh, we have uh, background theories, uh, discourse ethics, procedural justice, for example, and many kinds of uh, uh, theories of democracy or dialogic democracy and they are really important because this is the design and this is very important because it can give us a um, list of criterions to assess the quality or to help us to uh, build um, uh, uh, robust uh, um, uh, design to, to organize the participation or the deliberation. This is a reminder only to say that uh, perhaps now, after open democracy, after participatory democracy, after deliberative democracy, we have reached the step for a responsible democracy. It means that people involved can have different uh, responsibilities. This is only a reminder to say that uh, uh, the uh, some of the proposal of researchers and colleagues around responsible innovation in research have uh, returned on, on the concept of uh, deliberation, anticipation, reflectivity, responsiveness, and deliberation. But their um, uh, uh, definition of, of uh, deliberation is very, very, um, uh, it, it's not specific enough. It cannot help us to tackle the problem of uh, criticism because it's only um, a kind of um, uh, to broaden the range of perspectives and uh, to, to convey different values. But okay, when we will have seen that we are very different, how is it possible to move ahead? Uh, and okay, this is the, the question, deliberation for what? And why deliberation and, and the problem of deliberation? only a couple of, of uh, 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 publications, but, but we have a lot of um, amount of publication around this. And this is a really interesting um, uh, two years, uh, three years before uh, the handbook of deliberative democracy, the Oxford handbook uh, has been published. And there uh, it's a kind of, for example, if you read the book uh, or the, the, the chapter of, of Goodin is okay, we have, return back to communication only and we have lose what the concept of deliberation has in specific and we have lose the um uh the requirement to to argue and to present arguments uh this is only one list of uh, deliberative democracy in the polit political field because what was a bit um a puzzling is that a lot of people have published on responsible innovation without having read or taken uh, some research coming from the deliberative uh, um, field in, in, uh, in, in political science and, and especially in political theory. So uh, you know that we can have different kind of uh, understanding of, of responsibilities and if, for example, only to give you an, ex an example, in this kind of participatory experiment, you have only people there playing a role or assuming a role, and they have no authority, they have no specific capacity, or perhaps worse, they have no special virtue to assess and to give their um, advice in this case of participation, the participation will be very low uh, and, and, and the results will, will be very low, especially uh, to when you will have to move from this lab to the deliberative system at large we have with the different um, uh, powers, with the legislative one, the executive one, with the court of justice, with uh, the different kind of knowledges embedded uh, the knowledge for of the biologist or the medical researcher, for example, when you speak about the COVID, it's very important. We have not organized a, a, a participatory event to know what we have to do to tackle the COVID crisis. So it's the bit 
the same thing. We have to be a responsible and to see what kind of responsibility are placed in uh, such and such place, places. Okay, we have the existing responsibility, what we do already and what uh, everybody is doing, and they are not the same because uh, we are in very sophisticated society and that's good. Uh, we have to be responsive between the different arenas, uh, between the different labs or between the labs and the existing uh, distributed responsibilities we have in, in a, um, an institutional system. And there you, you have the recap coming from the individual responsibilities, the role, the task, the virtues, the capacities, the collective responsibilities, uh, the ethical and the political deliberation. And it's, it's very difficult to organize both. Perhaps it will be endless on the ethical side, but we have to decide, and we will decide in a moment on the political side. Um, and we have uh, from the interinstitutional deliberation towards responsible democracy, thanks to an equilibrium in the burden of the different responsibilities in their understanding and, and uh, how we will match them. This is only a reminder to say now, when we speak in political science about uh, critical citizenship, it's only the first level, the reactive critic, but we can have more sophisticated forms of critic, an evaluative critic. You have the way to assess what is said. You can do, this is the first step, order proposal, and fourth, you have uh, the openness uh, to recognize that other people can be critiques as you are critiques and you have to organize or to to agree in a way to make this dif the, the different critiques uh, in, a, in, in a coexistence and and I think uh, and there and I will stop with this with a uh, responsible innovation or with responsible democracy we will have perhaps a fifth level of critiques. It's the collective judgment or considered. And I will stop there because I cannot move uh, ahead. Ah, oh, it's blocked. What can I do? Just uh, end the presentation pressing the skip button. Ah, arrête. Thank you. Ouais. <laughs> voilà. Voilà. Well, thank you, Bernard. I think you gave us uh, so much information, and uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, thinking of different aspects. I have difficulties now in summarizing and capturing the whole thing. But I, I think, I think what amongst the different points that you you touched, the, I, I see the difficulty that you're trying to highlight in uh, in using, let's say, deliberative or participatory approaches to, to the future of research and innovation, given the complexity of deliberative systems as well, of deliberative democracy as well, and the complexity that uh, is often not really taken to the full extent into account of plurality, you know, pluralism that you have, especially when it comes to the European level. Because I imagine that you you had this experience in France where you have like different actors and different values and backgrounds uh, coming together in order to discuss common challenges like you know, the, the the sustainability of our futures, let's say, which should like you know put everyone on the same on the same page. Where but this didn't happen because you had different uh, different drivers, different things. How can you then do that? And this is what also Georgios was saying. How can you do that when you have different um, national strategies, you have different uh, cultural uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, what's best for us? So th 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 this pluralism in terms of values, in terms of epistemology, you know? this is one thing that you also raised in the past. You know? Science is not uniform, it's not aligned at all. It's very pluralistic as well. So. Uh, I, I see all the, the, the issues that uh, eventually arise in Europe will have to face if they want to really uh, enhance and improve this, this uh, democratic side of, uh, of how to, to establish the objectives of research. Um, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure. I mean, would you say that, uh, then of course, I don't know if there are questions because I'm... I'm monopolizing a bit the discussion i'm sorry for that 
Um, would you say that then it can can be said that uh, a deliberative approach can also be a step forward in a responsible approach to, res to research innovation? Let's say if if we if deliberation or let, let's for the sake of simplicity we, we talk about deliberation of course it's a universe as you said deliberative processes are a way of uh, merging and keeping together different layers of responsibility i think that's one of the mistakes that we we often tend to to do is to to be let's say uh not really attentive to the fact that responsibility is a kind of a cumulative, no integrative concept. So it's uh, you can't really take one of the meanings, no, because otherwise you miss up on uh, on the other meanings. And uh, perhaps, as you said in that table, no, you put them all together, and by using all those meanings of responsibility, uh, you can you can kind of um, implement some deliberative approaches. Because in order to deliberate, you need to have those all those meanings. Someone needs to be accountable. You often say that, no? Uh, the problem with deliberation and participation is like, you know, are you then accountable for your decisions? So who's made accountable for decision in collective decision making, no? Uh, the relation between collectivity and individual responsibility, because responsibility is, I would say, from my perspective, always an individual concept. So, yeah, sorry for being long. Yeah, and, and you want one, how many answers do you want? <laughs> 15. Now, to, 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 to recap, yeah. uh, I think uh, uh, the problem uh, when we, we organize very huge experiments, uh, for example, the Grand Débat National, what is new with this kind of things and in the trend of the, de the different steps in, in uh, uh, the theory of deliberative democracy is, is that now we have doers who have no interest in, in theory, they have not read what is written on deliberative democracy, but since they think that if you participate, and especially if you have um, a citizen chosen by sortition, the result will be a, a positive and very good, and they will do a better job. And we think the same thing on the European level, but it's much more difficult, and we can return on that if you want after. But for me, as open science, this is only the zero ground. Okay, let's participate. And it was my first uh, sentence. Yeah. So thanks to deliberation, we have uh, around, but it's a very old question. Deliberation um, started, for example, in the beginning of the, the US institutions, but it was only understood for a system, a big political system, but not for many publics. But now for many people, deliberation is only for experiments in lab with many publics. But it's true, it's interesting because in deliberation theory, but okay, you have many ways, but uh, at least, first of all, you take seriously into account the disagreements and we know that we will have disagreement on the future of Europe. We know that we have a disagreement of social justice, for example, with the Grand Débat National and, and the French Convention for, for the, the, the climate. But if you organize tomorrow a discussion of what is expected for Europe for in, in, uh, artificial intelligence, you will have disagreement. Deliberation can help you to deal with a, um, disagreement. And second thing, and it's much more appropriate for our discussion, is that deliberation is uh, starts when you have uh, uncertainty. You don't know exactly what you have to do. You have different proposals, and there you need to deliberate. It's very old. It's, it's, it comes with Aristotle. But I think all these discussions are really interesting, but we discuss only. And the connection with actions is only to judge the actions before or to uh, be very negative afterwards. But what happened in between with the people who do the things? And there, I think, the, the concept and the different understandings of responsibilities is very, very promising because you have uh, the connection between discussion and then action and the way you act and the way you control what you act. And sometimes it's not, it's beyond your control because uh, with technologies, it's beyond your controls. And in, in sophisticated and complex societies, you need to have a system of accountabilities with different kinds 
of players. And I think uh, if we can do the same work as the work that has been done in deliberative democracy with responsible democracy, and perhaps in 10 years we've considered democracy because of, but it will be for another um, uh, project, European project, I think there you um, are more constrained because everybody has specific responsibilities and you are not like a citizen chosen by a sortition there, no accountability towards nobody. Uh, for example, Nina has explained and presented to us many kind of co-organized, co-decision, uh, co-many things, but people were there. What are their responsibilities in terms of uh, capacities and what can they do? And afterwards, in terms of accountability. I think it's a very, very, very relevant uh, point. I mean, it's like, uh, but from your perspective, you think that this is like a potential passage, a shift between the ethical dimension of Horizon 2020 and the political uh, relevance of Horizon Europe it, it is something good, beneficial? Is it like we're moving forward or? I think when we speak, when we're reaching back to open democracy and this kind or open research, for me, it's it's the return to the cave or to the starting point. Uh, you know, when you open your house, you open your house and people enter. And after that, you sit down. Okay. And what do you do? There, you need more sophisticated things. How will you organize the discussions? And who is responsible for what? We are not only like people... Uh, showing uh, the television and saying and only uh, judging what is happening afterwards uh, after uh, uh, beyond our responsibility and our understandings so i think um uh, if when we move uh forward uh, we forget or we we let aside we get rid of responsibilities we miss a lot because it, it, it was, it, it, I, I've, I've tried to, to present that if you know who is responsible for what in the system, it's the first important thing before to judge or to assess or to say it's better to do this and this and this and this. And after that, perhaps you will, uh, you can climb the different meaning, for example, moving from capacity to excellence. Yeah. No, I think the very interesting uh, aspect that emerged from, from this session, especially from this last contribution, I would say, because it was maybe more, uh, more philosophical in a way, so uh, e at least easier for me to understand, perhaps. Uh, I apologize for that. I think it's, it's, it's this thing. On the one hand, we have an ethical or an approach to ethics that has been, let's say, criticized or accused or, let's say, uh, went under scrutiny because of its ambiguity, because of the fact that uh, sometimes it's a, like a buzzword, you know, you have to be responsible, but it doesn't really specify what does it mean to be responsible, how can we really be responsible, what are the capabilities or the capacities that we need to like also uh, ensure in order to ask subjects to be responsible, uh, which has been uh, one of the, the main uh, weaknesses of the RI uh, notion understanding. I was... Uh, often all the things around it were presupposed and not uh, perhaps entirely discussed. No, the, the, the tools, the practical tools to really do that were not uh, sufficiently, I would say, identified or explained or highlighted. And on the, one, on the other hand, I think that uh, what Bernardo also was trying to say, but I think Nina as well at the beginning with the, with, the, with the topics, is the fact that there's a lot of attention to stakeholder engagement, to participation, to deliberation, but again, probably the risk is that even here we're not defining uh, how to deal with the complexity that this, uh, these appeals also entail in a way. You know? The fact that you want to say, yeah, if you participate, everything will be good. No, it's not exactly like that. You know? uh, I mean, this is an old, an old story for political theories, the different levels of influence that participation also um, can have. I think, I think you all have managed to highlight in different ways this, 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 these aspects. The fact that perhaps there must be a complementary approach between ethics, so the definition of, of the values, of the norms, of the, of the substance, and political theory. You know? I think that the two 
uh, should be should be made a little bit closer uh, if we want to give a meaningful sense to to what has been done in Horizon 2020 or the money that has been spent, but also to to try to establish a more significant and democratic approach to to the to what research and innovation uh, can do to shape our future our future society. So. Something, uh, politics without ethics can be very detrimental, can be instrumental, uh, as well as ethics without uh, the appropriate political support uh, can be uh, a bit vague, a bit ambiguous, and therefore uh, fragile, fragile to, to confusion, to, as well to manipulation some, in some cases. And I think this is a very fantastic like, lesson that I, I personally learned uh, from all of you today. Um, I missed a question, uh, so I don't know if uh, Cherifa Yari, you're still there? You want to pose the question to Georgios? Because I didn't want to interrupt the flow, but... Uh, thank you very much. I just want to, uh, to say, thank you very much. I just want to say, how could we make a change, a real change and reforms to uh, prevent the misuse of technology? Thank you very much. Thank you, Cherifa. Who would like to answer to that? <laughs> Thank you very much. I think this connects also a little bit with, uh, I will connect it uh, a little bit with what you have been discussing, uh, Bernard and uh, Robert. Uh, but of course, I will not mess with political philosophers. I'm very careful on that. Uh, but definitely, a word on deliberation. Deliberation is indeed a technique to cope with uncertainty and to make it more, more, more robust. And this is, I mean, in a very generic uh, way, uh, I, I would not agree more with that. Now, in the years to come, there will be enormous pressure and strain to all liberal democracies around the world, which are declining. We have to... Um, to keep an eye on that and on the EU. Um, so uh, the pressure in the years to come would be for the EU to make business, to import and export and collaborate with non-democratic regimes, with repressive regimes, also in research exchange, but also in imports and exports and so on. So I think this will be the proof of the pudding for uh, applying such high standards um, in research and innovation um, processes. In this respect, this internal functioning will need to prove itself with the external framework conditions which are becoming um, with exercising more and more pressure to deliver, to be effective. And for example, this is what the Chinese do in a very successful way from their perspective. There is no much deliberation. If there is deliberation at all, there are very clear and uh, vertical command and control lines in the hierarchy. This allows them to follow a genuine um, uh, whole of government approaches, but also this allows them to have longer hor planning horizons than four or five years. So please understand me as advocatus diaboli right now, um, because this is something that uh, um, works in the one way or another in the People's Republic of China and on the other hand, in the European Union, with that multi-layered and um, multi-stakeholder governance, we have been certain difficulties, let us say. Perhaps this is an inherent uh, difficulty of democracy or of deliberation to set clear uh, long-term objectives and be really efficient and uh, effective in the implementation. I do not know. I'm not sure a proponent of repressive uh, illiberal regimes, but this is something that we need to, uh, to note in further planning. Now, coping with um, uh, technologies and all this unknown, 
I th I'm not a friend of this technological determinism that uh, says that technology poses certain constraints. I would say it is rather the other way around. Technologies are necessarily de facto embedded uh, in organizational contexts, in institutional contexts, in uh, regulatory contexts, and it is up to us to make that difficult decision. We may uh, make the decision that we will not uh, produce unethical AI, and this will diminish the competitiveness of European AI research. This is a, 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 around the world. This is a perfectly legitimate decision to be done. Of course, decision makers, but also citizens need to be clear on the middle and long-term consequences of something like that. This might be, I mean, I speculate, may reduce the, the overall GDP of the European Union. I mean, but this is a decision that needs a political decision and not a, a scientific decision or a decision by experts and scientists and, and all that, that needs to be uh, really openly uh, discussed. This would be the uh, what I would have to say in that context. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Shirifa, for your question. So do we have any other questions? Because uh, otherwise I think that we are very running very, very late. Uh, if someone wants to say something, um, otherwise I will have to unfortunately close the session here. Uh, our colleague Danny is going to post on uh, Twitter, if I'm not mistaken, Danny, uh, a resume of the session today. Um, Yes. Danny, you there? Yeah. Yes, I will do so. I've been just trying to see if I could post it in the chat, but it won't let me. So, uh, yeah, I will share that via my own Twitter, along with our contact information, should anyone want to get in touch with us. And, uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I would like to thank again uh, Nina Brown, John Pearson, Georgios Kolerakis, and Bernard Rebert for being here. Uh, it's been a wonderful session, unfortunately a bit uh, short, but, uh, you know, Philosophers tend to always speak a bit too much, and that's our thoughts. It's not uh, the organization thoughts, which was very, very well done. Thank you, Elmut. Thank you, Pia and Shona. Uh, they've been working on this uh, final conference event for months and months, and I think with uh, great results, uh, at least in this session, of course. Uh, let's see with the others. Uh, thanks, everyone, again. Thanks, Darian. Thanks, Danny, for being there today. And um, I hope this discussion, this conversation can be continued with other means. Uh, if you're interested in exploring this uh, relation between the two aspects and the two programs, uh, get in touch and be very happy to, to move forward in that. And let's hope Horizon Europe is going to be very successful and very democratic. Thanks again, everyone. Have a lot. Thank you.